Without further ado, Mr. Kevin Meyer. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction, and one day I would like to meet the person that you just described. <laughs> it is indeed an honor to, to stand before you this evening, and to, or this morning, excuse me, and to recognize John for the, the role that he is playing as he has stepped in to fill the shoes for the late Joseph Chandler. Those are some mighty big shoes to fill, and you're doing a fantastic job. <coughs> it is indeed an honor to stand before you this morning in, in the place where so many folks that I've had an opportunity to meet in our short time here in Connecticut have stood before you and addressed you. Folks like Keith Coons, John Turner, Bill Dyson, Frederick Streets, Dorsey Kendrick, and Denise Nappy. Whether they're colleagues or friends, it is indeed an honor for me to stand here before you. I'd like to recognize the Shoreline Interfaith Representatives and the Brantford Storages Association as well as St. Stephen's a and &E Zion Church and our host, St. Teresa's Catholic Church. The selection committee in particular, none other than Miss Phoebe Chandler, who may be small in stature, but that woman is mighty in, in, in Mr. Louis Burns, who was back in the kitchen providing the food, and, and he and I uh, have a relationship that even predates my birth, and we'll talk about that in a few moments. <laughs> it is indeed a privilege to, to stand out and, and see so many of my friends and colleagues from Yale Haven Hospital. I greatly appreciate you coming out. My friends and neighbors from our community. I see family members that are here. I see a gentleman who is not only a friend, not only a confidant, not only as an advisor, but he is also my cousin and the reason I'm standing before you this morning, Howard Sizemore. And then the apple of my life. I mean, she is the honey in my tea. This is the woman that I get up every morning and I just thank God that I have an opportunity to be lying next to her. That is none other than my wife, and my ace buku is Gamma. So, this day, this national holiday, this day of Martin Luther King's birthday, a day that was first signed into law by Ronald Reagan in 1983, and observed for the first time as a holiday in 1986. Officially, all 50 states then acknowledged this as a holiday in the year 2000. That's quite a gap. In 1990, 1991, 1992, my wife, my daughters, and I, we marched in the streets of Arizona attempting to push the legislator to recognize this day as a holiday. We were unsuccessful, along with the hundreds of thousands that marched beside us. It wasn't until a little small organization called the NFL got on the phone with the folks in Arizona and said, we have this little game called the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 27. You wish to have it in Sun Devil Stadium, which is the stadium of Arizona State University, my alma mater. They said, we have a deal for you. If you want Super Bowl 27, there will be a statewide celebration of Martin Luther King's birthday. In 1993, two things happened. One, there was a Super Bowl in Devil Stadium, uh, Sun Devil Stadium. Two, there was the acknowledgement of the Martin, Luther King, uh, the Martin Luther King holiday in Arizona. So it wasn't until 2000 when South Carolina then became the last state to adopt the holiday. So why are we here this morning? We're here to celebrate a great man's life. And when I was asked to concentrate my, my words around the theme, sooner or later, all people of the world will have to discover a way to live together. I came up with the theme that I was going to use, and it's called a conversation, a conversation with Dr. King. So after accepting the invitation to provide this message, I found myself confronted with a dilemma, a dilemma that found me talking to myself. 
Should I deliver a message consistent with the turbulent undercurrent associated with the current and recent presidential election? Should I address the growing economic chasm that is increasing to separate the one percenters from the middle class, the haves and the have-nots? Should I address the much needed national debate on gun control on the heels of Sandy Hook? Or should I debate the intellectual differences between two contemporary blockbuster cinema productions, Steven Spielberg's Lincoln and Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchained? Or should I provide a spiritual, feel-good, uplifting tribute to the greatest leader and gifted orator to ever walk the face of this earth. Given the opportunity and the uncertainty of my thoughts, I embarked upon an intellectual voyage that transcended time and space. I traveled back to Oslo, Norway, the evening before Dr. King accepted the Nobel Prize for Peace. And I had the opportunity to speak directly to Dr. King to gain some clarity. My questions to Dr. King were, why were you inspired to expect positive change when you accepted the Nobel Prize for Peace? How could you have expected the world to move forward some 48 years ago with the elegance that only Dr. Martin Luther King could possess? He provided me with a preview of what he was going to say in just a few short hours on that December 10th day in 1964. He said, young Mr. Maya, remember, this is my imagination, my conversation, okay? <laughs> young Mr. Maya, I'm mindful that only yesterday in Birmingham, Alabama, our children crying out for brotherhood were answered with fire hoses, snarling dogs, and even death. I am mindful that only yesterday in Philadelphia, Mississippi, Young people seeking to secure the right to vote were brutalized and murdered. Only yesterday, more than 40 houses of worship in the state of Mississippi were bombed or burned because they offered a sanctuary to those who did not accept segregation. I am mindful of the debilitating and grinding poverty that affects our people and chains them to the lower rung of the economic ladder. Therefore, Young Mr. Maya, I must ask why this prize is awarded to a movement which is beleaguered and committed to unrelenting struggle, to a movement which has not won the very peace of brotherhood, which is the essence of the Nobel Prize. Dr. King went on to say that after contemplation, I concluded that this award which I receive on behalf of that movement is profound recognition that nonviolence is the answer to the crucial political and moral questions of our time. The need for man to overcome oppression and violence without resorting to violence and oppression. You see, young Mr. Maya, civilization and violence are antithetical concepts. Sooner or later, all people of the world will have to discover a way to live together in peace, and therefore transform this pending cosmic elegy into a creative song of brotherhood. So I said, Dr. King, ho, 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 slow down, just one second, because I need to interrupt you, because this is where my struggle lies. For much has transpired since those days of 1964. I need to share with you that the United States of America has elected an African American as president. As a matter of fact, on this very day, Barack Obama, a man that I knew that you would have enjoyed meeting, is being sworn in for the second, his second term as the 44th president of these, as the distinguished and world-renowned poet Maya Angelou says, these yet to be United States of America. Other African Americans have emerged to levels of significance on both the national and the international political stage. Colin Powell, a retired four-year, excuse me, retired four-star Army General, served as the 64th, 65th U.S. Secretary of State. He was the commander of the U.S. Armed Forces and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. 
Condoleezza Rice, born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama, like you, the child of, of a minister and a teacher. She physically felt the vibrations of the explosion when the 16th Street Baptist Church was bombed, killing four young girls. She served as the 66th U.S. Secretary of State following Colin Powell. And are you ready for this, Dr. King? Are you ready for this? They served in a Republican administration. <laughs> Dr. King, in our society today, the word that is used to describe people that look like you and me, people of color, is minority. But it is also a, a term that will soon be refreshed as the complexity of our country darkens. For the first time in our country's history, minorities and women hold a majority of the Democratic Party in the House. The U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder is a minority. Additionally, the landscape of American businesses has forever changed as there are four black, nine Asian, six Latino, and 18 women who sit at the helm of corporate hierarchies as CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. During your time, Dr. King, approximately 40% of African Americans lived in poverty. The outcome of your lifetime of civil rights work resulted in the laws banning discrimination in education, housing, employment, and offered life-changing opportunities to those who are prepared and able to take advantage of open doors. Thus, African Americans living in poverty has been reduced to about 25%. Dr. King, as much as that is the good news, I'm afraid you'll be disappointed to hear that of the 25% who remain in poverty, they are continuing to lose ground. Unemployment rates for all Americans, while at the lowest level in five years, impacts Latinos and blacks at a higher rate. Some would argue as much as 50 to 100%. Economists indicate that just the equalization of unemployment for blacks alone would result in an additional 1.1 million jobs. Dr. King, our educational system, once the envy of the free world, now struggles to provide levels of education and knowledge to place our youth in competitive positions with peers on the international stage. The cost of a four-year education has increased to an excess of $15,000 for a state college and $32,000 for a public college, yet the median household income is around $54,000. Thus, our middle class, Dr. King, are finding it increasingly difficult to send their kids to college without burdening them with the financial debt upon graduation. Dr. King, you were a champion of peace and nonviolence, so it burdens my heart to tell you what else is going on in our country. Violence continues to rear its disgusting and repulsive head in our political arena, our cinemas, our playgrounds, our workplace, and even our schools and yes, still, our places of worship. Perhaps we are feeling the same emotion you felt on that dark September Sunday morning in 1963 with the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing. But would you believe, Dr. King, while all this is going on, we as a nation are gripped with the debate over the Second Amendment and the right to carry assault weapons or automatic firearms. Dr. King, as you well know, unaddressed, the root cause of gun violence will continue to snatch young lives from the streets of New Haven and Newtown. <coughs> However, Dr. King, we're not here to talk gloom and doom, for I, like you, refuse to accept despair as the final response to the ambiguities of history. I, like you, Dr. King, refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless moonlight of division and selfishness that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. I, like you, Dr. King, have the audacity to believe that people everywhere can and should have three meals, three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, and dignity, equality, and freedom for their spirits. I, like you, Dr. King, believe that what self-centered men have torn down men other-centered can build up. 
I, like you, Dr. King, believe that one day mankind will bow before the altars of God and be crowned triumphant over war and bloodshed and nonviolence. Redemptive goodwill will proclaim the rule of the land. I, like you, Dr. King, believe that we shall overcome. I believe that through the access to education, employment, lives can be changed. I believe that the words spoken by thousands of parents in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s still have value today. And they simply are that education is the one thing that can never be taken away from any of us. I believe that our collective actions need to play it forward by investing our prayers, time, money, and energy in the lives of those in our communities who are in need, whether that need be spiritual, emotional, or financial. We need to inspire people to dream again. We need to inspire people to believe. Why, after all of these years, are my beliefs still in sync with yours, Dr. King? I'm delighted that you asked. See, Dr. King, some 60 plus years ago, a young girl following her family from a little town in Danville, Virginia, came to New Haven, Connecticut, where she assisted her family making ends meet, doing the kind of work available for people that looked like her. She cleaned homes on Prospect Avenue. She was also blessed to spend her summers of her senior year in high school and her freshman year of college cooking for a family in Pine Orchard, not far from the, what was then called the Sheldon House. She went on to marry a man from Montclair, New Jersey, where they both attended college. Never in her wildest dreams did she ever imagine that decades later she would spend her 80th birthday visiting her son in his home within blocks of where she once worked. Never could she have dreamed that decades later, that same son would deliver a message in honor of you within a few short miles of where she once worked. Never in her wildest dreams would she imagine that her childhood friend, Louis Burns, would be preparing the breakfast for that occasion. And on that same day, the celebration of your birthday, a man named Barack Obama would be sworn in for his second term as President of the United States of America. You see, Dr. King, I believe that many of your speeches and your quotes embody that resonate in the hearts and souls of mankind in both your time and mine, no matter what the present challenges are, or what dangers exist, there is the need to dare to dream, the need to meet challenges and to move forward. See, Dr. King, change does come. <laughs> Birth through the canal of conflict, controversy, and trouble, change does come. As you have said, someday, sooner or later, all of the people of the world will have to discover a way to live together in peace. However, Dr. King, we still have a lot of work to do. So I thank you, Dr. King. I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to define and clarify how I would present to this group the celebration of your birthday in 2013. Thank you very much. Church family, please just stand and let the. <laughs> <laughs> 